Today I want to talk about Alcoholics Anonymous and I want to talk about how it's connected to gaslighting. Gaslighting is psychological manipulation done through lying, misinformation, and a lot of denial of the facts. Then what I want to do is I want to take three people that were extremely prominent in gaslighting, enough so that eventually the American Medical Association actually bought into the thought that alcoholism is a disease. So let's start with the first person. Now this is a long time ago, but uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush, very competent guy, because he actually signed the Declaration of Independence. So that's how far back this goes. So definitely a competent person. But let's look a little further into what he felt. Interestingly enough, he believed, now this is, might be offensive to some people, but it's a fact, so I have to say it. Dr. Benjamin Rush believed that being black was a disease. And he didn't believe that it was a disease of the skin. He believed that it was a disease of the person himself. And on top of that, during the time of yellow fever, he believed that black people, because of their disease, were immune to the effects of yellow fever. So with his supposed knowledge, he put a lot of black people in line to take care of people with yellow fever and eventually to bury the bodies because he said that they were immune. Of course, what this led to was a large amount of black people disproportionately dying from yellow fever because he's the one who put them in harm's way. So when we talk about alcoholism being a disease, we really have to start taking a look at some of the supposed bright minds that put this in front of the American Medical Association. So Dr. Benjamin Rush, again, signer of the Declaration of Independence, give him a thumbs up for that. But everything else he did was extremely shaky. Let's take a look at Dr. E.M. Jelinek. He promoted the alcohol concept of it being a disease. He also talked about the Jelinek curve, which is the basic progression that alcoholism would take as a disease, because diseases do that. Unfortunately, alcoholism is not a disease, and it doesn't follow a progressive stance the way he said. Now, interesting about Dr. Jelinek, Number one, he was not a doctor. That was a lie. And as he got older and he was getting closer to being on his deathbed, and he had enough money, he finally was able to come forth and admit that the studies that he did were fraudulent and the gelatin curve was not based on anything of fact. But even more interesting is that the people who promoted Alcoholics Anonymous still believe in the gelatin curve, even though the guy who invented it said that it was fraudulent. So let's take Bill W., who is uh, Bill Wilson, and he was the one who wrote what they call the big book, the Alcoholics Anonymous book, and came up with the 12 steps. Very interesting, when you look into his background, he had parents up until he was 10 years old, and they got divorced. From there, his mother abandoned him. She didn't want to have anything to do with him. So now it was up to the father to step up and be a parent. Well, he did the same thing. He also abandoned him. So now we take this young boy who has these parents who get divorced, and both of them just leave. They decide that they didn't want to be parents. So then his grandparents had to take over. Then he met the love of his life when he was 17, and she ends up dying. So Bill Wilson repeatedly talks about how he went through life being depressed, and he, he just doesn't seem to be able to make the connection between his childhood adversity, being rejected, being abandoned by his parents. What he does make the connection to is to say that alcohol makes him feel better which is another way of saying alcohol makes him numb to the pain he was experiencing. And unfortunately, he took that and went to a road where now millions of people are as numb as he was 
to what actually went on in his life. He didn't need alcohol, and he didn't need this 12-step program to help him. What he needed was some love and care in his life and somebody to talk about his childhood adversity. That's what he really needed. So let's take another quick look at this here. Alcoholics Anonymous was pushed through these three main, there's other ones, but these are the three main ones. Benjamin Rush, Dr. Jelinek, and Bill W. They not only gaslighted the world with their opinions and thoughts, they were gaslighting themselves because they were lying to themselves every step of the way. Part of it just to numb their pain and part of it just to get rich or famous. So in doing that, they have actually hurt millions of people. The world that these three people created is not really much different than Walt Disney creating Disneyland or a Disney World. They also came up with a bunch of slogans and other thoughts that absolutely have no bearing in reality. So let's go over a few of those. Number one, you can't handle a drop of alcohol without relapsing. Interesting thought, but what happens here is once somebody can buy into the thought that alcoholism is a disease, it puts all the responsibility on the caregivers and none on the people who are actually drinking. So if it were true that alcoholism was a disease, it would be true that a drop of alcohol would trigger a response to keep the progression going. Kind of makes sense until you go to the store and you realize that mouthwash has about 20% alcohol. And I think Listerine has about, it's 54 proof. So that would mean that every person who has supposedly alcoholism, every time that they use mouthwash, they would relapse. That makes no sense. So what they're saying is, that would be called a lie. Number two, they say an addict's brain is different than a normal brain. They were born that way. Well, here's the truth. An addict's brain is different than a normal brain. But here's why. Because it's that early childhood trauma that creates more of a reptilian brain where there's a fight or flight response all the time. And this creates a reptilian brain as opposed to putting the thoughts in the prefrontal cortex, which is for logic and reasoning. So yes, the reptilian brain is stronger. Prefrontal cortex is not as strong. So that is a difference, but it's not because of alcohol. Number two, if a person repeatedly masks their emotions, what they do is they weaken themselves and they become less and less able to handle their emotions. So they become immature and they become dysregulated. So that's true and that's in the brain too. So the addict's brain is different than what they call a normal brain. But again, it's not because of disease, it's because of decisions and lifestyle choices. Number three, whenever a person is continuously scanning the world for excuses, it creates a victim mentality and learned helplessness. And over time, that's very hard even for a therapist to get in there and help this type of person. But again, they weren't born with it, they created it. And number four, yes, if you were to do meth for four years, it's going to change the brain. But it's the decision of taking the drug that changes the brain. No brain is born with, unless your, parent, unless your mother is addicted to drugs and she gives birth, then that person would be addicted to drugs at that moment. But you weren't born with a defective, addicted brain. That makes no sense to anybody. There is absolutely no evidence to show that. Next on our list, they talk about faking it until you make it. That does not teach anybody to be honest, upfront, and authentic. It teaches people how to lie and to be fake. Which, of course, doesn't that make sense? It's a total projection of these three people I named before. Like Nietzsche would say, everything that we do or write is basically an autobiography. So when you see all these mistakes, all of what you're really looking at is the brain of Benjamin Rush, Jelinek, and Bill W. It's their projections of their own weakness. 
Another interesting concept, they talk about drug of choice. I've been in these meetings. When people talk about drug of choice, what they're really doing is they're romanticizing the drug that they have. Like, oh, cocaine is this for me. But here's the real truth. There is no such thing of drug of choice. If they don't have the ability to get one drug, they will take another. The drug of choice actually is anything that changes their perception of reality. Anything that stops them from actually taking control and responsibility of making a true and real change. That's the drug of choice. Also, very interesting concept, rock bottom. You have to hit rock bottom in order to get help. But let's think about that for a second. If it was a real disease, does anybody actually believe that you have to have stage four cancer before you start treating it? Do you have to have your first heart attack before you go in and get a bypass operation? Does that make sense to anybody? Do you start treating people for depression after they try to commit suicide? No, obviously not. Why? Because everything that has to do with, the A, with Alcoholics Anonymous is gaslighting, which again, it's manipulation of people through lying and misinformation and denial of facts. It's important to know. Let's talk a little bit about heroin epidemic that's talked about so much. There is no such thing as a heroin epidemic. And I'll tell you why. Because again, that's a drug. There is an epidemic though, and it's an epidemic of people who can't cope with their life. They don't have life skills. And if we were being totally upfront and honest, there is an increase in heroin. But there's an increase in people drinking alcohol, an increase in marijuana. There is an increase in every single drug. The, re the main reason why they're talking about the heroin epidemic is because it's affecting white people in middle class neighborhoods. That's when all of a sudden we start to care. Why? Because those are the people who can afford to go to alcohol and drug rehabs. That costs minimum of $5,000 a month. Now we start to care. And now we also understand why we want this to be part of the medical community and not somebody's psychological choices. Because once you can get an insurance company to pay minimum of $5,000 a month to cure a disease that is incurable, we have a billion, multi-billion dollar industry. So that's where the real truth is. So Lola was nice enough to come up with another question this week. And she's actually going to stay awake for today's show. That's pretty good. All right, so Lola's question for today is this. Does trying to help people who have drug and alcohol problems become a thankless job for you? Because I really care about your help. Okay, so I'm going to answer this for Lola here. And I'm going to be 100% honest. Let me tell you a few reasons why it becomes a thankless job. I've worked at drug and alcohol centers. It's really interesting. When a person starts doing drugs at a very, a very young age to get away from their true and real feelings, they become more and more immature. So you could have a conversation with a 35-year-old adult, but if they've started using drugs at 13 years old, you're a talking to an emotional 13-year-old, and it becomes really difficult to have an honest conversation about truth and facts. Doubling down on that, most of the people at drug and alcohol rehab centers are not professionals. They get the tag professional, but what they really are is sober for a few weeks, and then they're, they're supposedly helping people. And the adults there that are the helpers, they're just as immature as the people that they're trying to help. And so I've had a lot of run-ins with that. As a matter of fact, when I've gone to a meeting, there would be like about 20 people in one meeting. And you start bringing up some of these facts, and you start bringing up the, the dubious 
thoughts and comments of people like Benjamin Rush or that Dr. Jelinek was never a doctor, I start triggering them to be emotionally dysregulated and that I'm the bad guy. So I can tell you this, I was kicked out of meetings eventually for the last time and I had to have my own meeting on Friday nights by myself because, not because what I said wasn't true, because they admitted that it was true, but I didn't want to trigger all the other therapists into relapsing, which is a very interesting concept. Uh, let me talk a little bit about why it's a thankless job too, is because the medical community is on board with the lie, because they get paid a lot of money. And I'll just leave it at that. What's also interesting is the legal community. There are plenty of judges that mandate for people to take the 12-step program that's not based on any scientific evidence whatsoever and is taught by non-professionals. When there are professionals that have gone to school for 10 years, minimal, and they don't get the work out of these lawyers most of the time and judges because they're giving the work to non-professionals. And I'm not saying that there's something evil going on. I just feel that they don't know any better. They know their job very well, but they don't know psychology, unfortunately. Another reason why it may be a thankless job. I also got in trouble at <laughs> the rehab center because I had three guys run out of the room and complain about me that I told them that they were going to die. <laughs> this is how immature people get. But this is the real truth. When somebody goes into a 28-day rehab center, they get the drug pulled from them, obviously, because they don't have access to drugs while they're there. But what happens is, when you do that, they lose their tolerance for the drug that they were taking. What you need to do at this point is give them as many tools as possible in order to be able to be emotionally regulated so they don't go back to drugs. But they don't do that at rehab centers. So what happens is the very minute they step outside that rehab center for the first time, they are at most risk for dying. Why? Because they don't have any tools to live. And so what happens is they go directly back to the drug at the same dosage they did before. Meaning they don't have the tolerance anymore. So most people who die after going to rehab centers, it's within the first three days of leaving one. So technically speaking, it's better to have never have gone in the rehab center in the first place. And because I said the truth, these people were complaining, I get called into management again, and I go, Find me the evidence where I'm wrong, and I'll change my position. There isn't any. I was on the right side of that again. But of course, they want to make their $5,000 a month. So it becomes a problem. Uh, the last one I want to talk about is that, unfortunately, no matter how hard you work to educate people, to help people, to look inside their soul and to know that no matter how many bad things that they're doing to themselves or to somebody else, that's the best option or what they feel that they can do at the time. But they've been so enabled and they've been so brainwashed by this type of information that the people who need to hear the information the most are the least capable of hearing it, accepting it, and doing something about it. And that's been my point of con contention every time I work with that population, is that it becomes a thankless job because every time you tell them the truth, they hate you for it. And you have, a, let's call it an existential crisis at that time. Because do you want to lie to people to get on their good side and maybe hold a job? Or do you want to do the right thing to help people? And hopefully down the line, people start to understand what you're saying. And then they can at least look back at you and know that you're a person of value and virtue. And that's been a little bit difficult for me. So as Lola asked me, she's worried about my stress level. Well, I've come to grips with it and I am okay with being who I need to be and giving the right information as much as I can. And I'm okay with that. 
So thanks for listening, and that's my show about Alcoholics Anonymous and how it coincides and is really a gaslighting company. Thank you.